Okay, are we running? Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karsten Fries. I work here at NUPI. I'll be your moderator today. Um, we're going to talk about Macedonia. Um, not much news about Macedonia, but suddenly a few weeks ago there were stories, even Norwegian media, that uh, that uh, there were violence taking place. And unfortunately, typically, when something violent happens, that's when it comes up in media. Um, that's unfortunate. But on the, on the other hand, no news is good news, right? So that there hasn't been much news, I guess it's been a sign that things are going well in the region. However, uh, those of us who follow it a little bit closer realized there was something strange about this, this incident, and there had been some big political scandals before and demonstrations in Macedonia, lots of things happening. A uh, bit confusing picture. Uh, so we thought it's time for us to update us, ourselves a little bit on, on the situation in the country. Um, here you go. Um, therefore, we invited our dear friend and colleague, Andrea Bogdanovsky, from our, our sister institution or, or, or partner in, in Skopje, uh, Analytica. Uh, to basically give us an update so what happened to the most promising country in the region that suddenly seems to be facing serious problems now and that, that was not uh, there before. Um, um, so uh, before I open, I'll just remind you that this is streamed live, so we will open for questions, but uh, please remember that uh, this, is, this is also available on the internet live. Um, and, and I also like to mention that this is part of a Europe series that we have here at NUPI, uh, which is funded by the MFA, so I'm very pleased for that, and that makes it a possibility for us to, to have these events. And also, Andrea will write a kind of paper policy brief for NUPI later on, so it will be available on our website if you want to read some of the stuff that he's writing. Uh, so with no further ado, I think I'll pass the word to you, Andrea. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you very much, Carson, for the very uh, nice uh, introductory remarks. Uh, it's great to be in Oslo. It's great to be here for uh, uh, several times now. Uh, I'm especially delighted that uh, I'm invited by our sister partner organization, as you've put it, uh, NUPI. We've been collaborating for the last several years. Um, it, it's good to be here, um, and it's good to be in Oslo. It's a city that I always come back to, uh, and it's a city where I first started uh, and we actually visited in 2009. And I'm super uh, glad that uh, I see very familiar faces around uh, the audience today. And um, in 2009, when I was doing my uh, master's course in peace research at the University of Oslo, we were talk talking about um, our role in the future, and uh, I'm extremely happy that today I'm a little bit more aware of that. Um, so uh, back, the, 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 back then the project was uh, by the Nance and Dialogue Center, so many texts on that note. Um, I'm especially delighted that I'm talking on the Europe series. I think that um, um, this, this, this debate and this forum is a great possibility to uh, give us a picture about where Europe stretches and where it does not. It reminds us that also Europe uh, is having uh, several pockets or neighborhoods which are not necessarily always uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's this unfinished puzzle of the European Union uh, enlargement uh, area, and it still requires a lot of attention. Now, I would like to go and say by the, the fact that the Western Balkans is still Europe's unfinished uh, business. It is part of its immediate neighborhood, it's in its back doors. And it's, it's good to talk about the region. I had the chance to go, go through the YouTube videos posted under the YouTube series, and, and I'm happy that it's getting on attention. And it's good to discuss and put the, the, the region on track. Because what's happening uh, in terms of European sur uh, surroundings, uh, if you take Ukraine, if you take the MENA region, is that 
you know, there has been a lot of discussions and talks on these um, uh, two regions, but the Western Balkans has been always seen as a completely different different story. And, and it's a good thing, I think. The Western Balkans, it's... Uh, should not be seen as Europe's neighborhood. It should, and I'm always advocating for this, it should be seen as Europe's EU's uh, new member states, because that's what we are going to be. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And that's why I think that uh, Europe and Brussels should have a different policies when it comes to uh, Belgrade, Pristina, Skopje, Zagreb than they have uh, in Tunisia, for example. So I'm glad that, that we're discussing uh, this uh, into the context of Europe series. Um, so what are we discussing here today is Macedonia in focus, and the main premise is how the country that has been one of the front runners in the region has all of a sudden, or throughout the several years, slipped and now it's one of the laggards. What were the main drivers behind this, and where, where can we take, take from there? Now, I just want to when we say one of the front runners, I just want to give you several examples. In 2005, um, I, I, I forgot to take, I have a newspaper, where, a Macedonian newspaper, when one of the stories was how the Croatian public was confused and they were a bit irritated that Macedonia is going to be the country that would join Croatia together, uh, they would join together and be part of the EU, and how the Croatian public felt that that may slow down Croatian accession. Now, that was very interesting because it just illustrates where Macedonia was. Croatia is a new, fully-fledged EU member state. and they, they got into the EU in 2013, got into NATO in 2008. Macedonia is where it is at the moment. It's, it still hasn't moved an inch from uh, 2005. Another example with, would be even stronger one. It would be the so-called Stabilization and Association Agreement, which would be the preface of any EU enlargement for the Western Balkans. Now, it's, it's an agreement that the EU concludes with uh, potential member states in the Western Balkans, especially that um, sort of puts a stamp on the uh, EU accession prospects of this country. Macedonia was the first um, among the Western Balkans, which in 2001 signed this agreement. And in 2003, it entered into force. Um, just last week, uh, there was uh, an example of uh, celebratory talks and discussions in Sarajevo, because in Sarajevo, it was just uh, last week that this stabilization and association agreement came into force. So we are talking about a span of 15 years uh, when we look in Macedonia into the context. A last example would be on NATO. Uh, Macedonia has been part of the membership action plan, which would be the framework for future members of the alliance since 1999. And for example, Montenegro, uh, it was just a few years ago that, that, that started uh, uh, to become a fully fledged member of this uh, membership action plan. I think it was 2000 and December 2013, if I'm not wrong. So this just illustrates you how Macedonia regressed over the years. Um, apart from these positive sides, there is also there are numerous challenges which the country has been faced in the last 20 years. Of course, it's the only country uh, from former Yugoslavia that uh, went through the breakup without a scratch. It was a peaceful, and it, back in the days it was called even the oasis of peace. But validating its independence in the 90s was very difficult, and that's where the whole struggle begins. Um, uh, it entered in the e UN in 1993 under the reference to the name uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and it was vetoed. It couldn't progress to other uh, state, uh, to other multilateral uh, international organizations such as Council of Europe until it reached an agreement with Greece, which was called Interim, Interim Agreement in 1995, uh, that enabled the country to establish relations with the EU, and then also to join other multilateral organizations such as the Council of Europe, etc. So, and then of course in 2001, and with the Kosovo war, um, there was a spillover effect which resulted in the internal armed conflict in 2001, which has dramatically uh, changed the structure and the, um, uh, let's say, framework and the architecture of the country with the 
signing of the uh, peace agreement called Ohrid Framework Agreement, which embedded a number of, uh, of uh, solutions allowing uh, non-majority communities, among which the ethnic Albanians, greater rights, whether that would be identity rights or language, uh, national symbols, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where are we today? Uh, internationally, on the international system, We are having EU and NATO accession, which is a stalemate process. On regional standing, uh, we don't have the best uh, of relations with our immediate neighbors, some of them. Uh, partly it's because we in the region, in the Balkans, are what, we are, what I identified and what I call it is a bullying foreign policy, which is very interesting these days. Uh, wherever you look, south, east, north, west, you see it happening. But we have also become one of the bullies as well. So uh, I'm afraid that it's a trend that we need to get out of it and uh, start acting uh, um, as um, member states, one of the member states of the EU and NATO. Um, domestically, uh, at the moment, uh, there is one of the biggest political crises in a uh, country's recent history where the wiretapping scandal, where more than 20,000 people have been allegedly wiretapped illegally. And we have seen through the years a backslide of democratic processes, which I'm going to talk about uh, later on. On the more positive side, we also have somewhat a positive economic outlook. But that would be something that would be heavily impeded by the recent political crisis and uh, the worsening of the security situation uh, in the country. And that's where we have increased security challenges. Of course, I will speak about Kumanova, but also we have other uh, threats that are not only applicable to also for the whole of the Western Balkans, which was the threat of the foreign fighters, where, where the, uh, uh, which are uh, going from the region to Syria and Iraq but also the influx of uh, migrants going to, through uh, the region and then going to the EU um, and elsewhere. Um, I will try to give exam uh, sorry, answers to several questions. What is the role of the international community in all of this? Why and how Macedonia happened to be in the global media? I sort of, I even put in a region newspaper, I think, at the end. Um, what is holding the country back and ways to look ahead? Um, let me start by, by unpacking the role of the international community. When we talk about its role, it's interesting to see whether it would be seen as constructive, helpful, or maybe even it's making things worse. Uh, which one would it be? Or maybe it's all of them. Uh, it's very complex because what we understand by international community, it's one of those uh, scholarly debates that are uh, happening uh, um, everywhere, but in the case of Macedonia, that would be the EU at this stage. The EU would be seen as the main interlocutor. Brussels would be seen the place where Macedonia turns when it comes to crisis. And it is so because it is deeply embedded into the enlargement package of the EU. It applied for membership in 2004. And it's, it's, it's very much, when you look into the progress reports, you would see that even on legislation, the country has really advanced, and it has, there are areas where it, it, it has fully um, satisfied Brussels norms and adopted the EU law. Um, but also, the EU is, as I mentioned, the main uh, partner where we turn every time there is a crisis. And trust me, there, that's happening quite often. Um, at the moment, uh, with the um, uh, political crisis in Macedonia, um, Brussels, uh, through the enlargement and negotiation and neighborhood uh, commissioner, Johannes Hahn, is trying to uh, mediate uh, between the political parties, but also members of the European Parliament are also uh, part of this uh, process. And it's, it's not only this crisis, also the crisis before, there were many attempts by the EU to resolve this. What about the United States? Um, Washington has been kind of silent in the last several years. Uh, and it's interesting because it's normal. It's the region, it's part of the, you know, it's EU's backyard. 
as I mentioned, it's future member states we're talking about. The EU should exert its influence over the region. Um, but wash, uh, what the EU is lacking is the so-called bulldozer diplomacy, which only Washington can, can induce. And sometimes we've seen, and now we're witnessing with the uh, involvement of the EU in unblocking the political crisis, um, that maybe sometimes this is very much needed. And also we have the new kit on the block, um, and it's not a kit, but Moscow's role uh, in Macedonia's internal politics is uh, growing day by day. And that's interesting also to unpack, which I would uh, uh, speak about it later on. Now, we need to understand also how the enlargement process works in terms of the EU enlargement process, uh, in terms of understanding how and why the country is where it is now. Um, of course, it's been the case for Central and Eastern Europe. It's been the case for Croatia. It's the carrot and stick policy, right? You do reforms and you get rewarded with just closing yet another chapter, and then you, you get into the queue and you conclude negotiations and you become a member state. But I think that uh, this principle in the case of Macedonia has been challenged um, because it cannot function due to the... Um, uh, Veto by EU member state agrees. Uh, Athens is uh, several years in a row blocking Macedonia's progress on EU accession. And the name dispute has been hampering uh, uh, Macedonia's EU and NATO accession for the last 10 years or so. Um, the name dispute as such as long, it's 20 years long dispute. Uh, it is uh, mediated by the United Nations, but so far there are no concrete results. On, on, on resolving this issue. Uh, it was supposed to be resolved with 1995, well, a little bit resolved in 1995 with the interim agreement, according to which, uh, it's an agreement that signed Macedonia and Greece, according to which Greece should not uh, veto and block Macedonia's accession to international organizations which Greece is a member of, so that would include NATO and the EU. But that's not the case. We're seeing uh, something completely different. And the view from Athens is that uh, Macedonia has irredentist moves and irredentist policies towards its southern neighbor. Uh, it does history claims. Um, and Skopje's views are that, of course, this is not um, um, the case. I mean, we do not have any powers or means to have any irredentistic uh, uh, views on, on, on uh, the, our southern neighbor, Greece. Uh, and also, according to uh, the population, the public in Macedonia, uh, Greece is not uh, one of the main things is the identity markets, it's language and uh, culture and history, which according to, to the people, Greece is not respecting. So, and then of course, uh, when you put all of this in context, you have this. So when this turned to be the, the flagship project of the current government, it's called Skopje 14, uh, when the government in Macedonia decided to revamp the central part of the, of the town with neoclassical architecture, with Baroque uh, uh, um, um, style. Um, and of course, I should have put uh, uh, the erected uh, monument of Alexander the Great. This has strengthened this... Uh, um, uh, polarization of the relations between Macedonia and Greece, and many would argue that would have, this would have given Greece what it needed in order to um, uh, block uh, furthermore Macedonia's succession and undermine Macedonia's uh, position regarding the name dispute. The country has been uh, EU candidate since 2005, and the European Commission started uh, issuing recommendations to start accession negotiations since 2009. So every year, the European Commission would say that the country satisfies political criteria, economic criteria, and would be, this would be enough for the country to progress to official opening of the chapters. But every time when, the solution, when the, this comes in front of the EU Council, uh, the Greek uh, authorities, the Greek Minister of Foreign Affairs would, uh, would veto uh, this one. So the recommendations by the European Commission is getting weaker and weaker because the stick policy doesn't work with Macedonia anymore. And the country, the authorities in Skopje got very comfortable in this position. 
because they would blame the Greeks for not uh, inducing any reforms. And this is very comfortable. So they can pick and choose what policies they, they, they want to reform or they don't want to reform at all. For example, we have adoption of many laws, which if you see how they adopt it, the end, the, the, the end uh, sentence says, the law will get into full implementation when the country joins the EU. What does that mean? You know, it's, when does it, that going to happen? So it's just um, an interesting and unique position for enlargement process. Um, the EU, of course, between Athens and Skopje, tried to do some creative approach. It initiated so-called high-level accession dialogue, which was very short-lived, and many say that it was a fake uh, accession, um, uh, 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 fake process of accession uh, of Macedonia. And it's, it was uh, not realistic. And there's also those that say that Brussels, in the case of Macedonia, preferred to see the country stable, secure, but not necessarily you know, get much involved into daily politics, which would cause only headaches to Brussels. And you know, the EU has a lot what's happening in the region, starting from Ukraine, the MENA region, etc. Now let me go fast track to uh, February 2015, where we had a so-called wiretapping scandal, uh, or the main opposition party calls them bombs. It's, um, it's a large-scale operation. That's, that's, that's the key to understand. The main opposition party, SDSM, claims that there are more than 20,000 people who, comes from, who come from different walks of life, whether it's civil society representatives, religious leaders, um, whether it's high government officials, political opponents, union members who have been illegally wiretapped for years. Uh, and this, is, this has been all conducted by uh, the Secret Service and the counterintelligence. Uh, the uh, view from the ruling party is that this was coup d'etat attempt. And this has been conducted by the main opposition party with the help and support by the foreign intelligence services. Of course, till now, we haven't heard who these foreign intelligence services would be. But playing on this victim card just reinforces nationalism. Um, some of the findings and uh, some of the materials that were leaked suggest uh, a compelling evidence of corrupted uh, high government officials, uh, election fraud, uh, lots of xenophobic language, total control over judicial and media uh, affairs, even cover-up of a murder. Um, so we need to consider, when we are looking into this wiretapping scandal, we need to consider two tracks. The first one is the content. What, does the actual, what, what do the actual recordings say about illegal, uh, illegal behavior of those that are elected? But also, it's really interesting to see to analyze that this is a breach of Macedonia security system, regardless of where it comes from and who has performed this. Because don't forget, Macedonia is also a signatory to many NATO uh, documents and lots of the classified information, for example, is shared with Macedonia as well. So if you have uh, the main opposition party claims to have a material that would be enough to have two or three years of materials to be leaked at least two times a week. So that just says a lot about of the large scale that I, I mentioned before. Now, this has helped a lot um, to the opposition party. It has resurrected them from the dead. Uh, before, uh, before the wiretapping uh, scandal, uh, they were in a more of a comatose state because with the backside of democracy, they could not be allowed equal access to different platforms. For example, media, which are under state uh, control, most of them, would not attend their press conferences. So what they have to say in terms of projects would never float in the media. And also, this has increased the public debate and also public interest. Um, wiretapped content brought people on the streets. So every day, even today, at 6 PM, people would protest asking for um, resignation from uh, um, prime minister. And this has culminated on the 17th of May. Um, oops with um, 
with a massive anti-government rally in front of the government building, um, asking for uh, resignation of the of the current uh, uh, government. And it, this is interesting because it was, as you can see, it was big numbers. This was unheard of for Macedonia conditions before. And also, um, it was across ethnic lines. When you look, try and, you know, if you go on Twitter, you'll see lots of iconography from people wearing uh, Albanian flags, Macedonian flags. It this didn't matter. Um, and there was one consensus, and that was that the government, this should be seen as a red, uh, red flag to the government. Uh, as a result, not of the protests, but of the international efforts, three high government officials have resigned, the Minister of Transport, Minister of uh, Police, and the counterintelligence uh, chief have uh, uh, resigned. And that was uh, seen as an attempt to uh, try and solve the situation, but it did not uh, happen. Now, let me go, uh, I mentioned several times about democratic uh, deficiencies. When we read about, uh, when we read stories from analysts who are outside, writing on Macedonia outside the region, outside Macedonia and the region, we see how analysts uh, or researchers tend to illustrate the democratic uh, backslide through numbers and figures, which is absolutely fine. Um, here is just, I will do the same. So here is just um, an example, two examples. Uh, the first one would be a report on media freedoms in Macedonia from Freedom House. Um, Sorry, on Reporters Without Borders. Um, so here, on, on political freedoms, you would see that Macedonia uh, had problems just after the, uh, after the armed conflict. But now you see how uh, the thing is going downwards again in terms of political freedoms, which illustrates um, into quantitative uh, saying um, uh, how the democracy is going... Uh, uh, down. Also, um, um, media freedoms, you can see that in 2014 the country was ranked 123, while in 2006 it was 43, in 2009 it was 34, so this is a massive, massive uh, drop. Um, and even in 2009 it was ahead of, uh, ahead of the US, now we are last in the region. Um, but, you know, be operating uh, in, in Macedonia civil society and working uh, every day on, on, on issues on security sector reforms uh, and taking part of different civil society activities, we, are, uh, we have the experience to share how does democratic big slide look in practice. Uh, we have this phenomena of so-called counter-protests, so which this government has practiced a lot. So, for example, whenever you would have genuine civil society movement, which would protest, let's say, against the government uh, attempt to cut the trees in the city center because of this Skopje 2014 protest, you would have the government, through its uh, uh, political machinery, organizing counter-protests. Then you would have the state media, so basically lots of the mainstream media, who would report about this counter-protest, and that would sideline the very genuine, authentic protests that people were protesting about, you know, that the trees should not be uh, are cut. And this goes hand in hand with um, language, very disturbing one, saying that those that protest are Western-backed organizations, and that they want to have, uh, that they are traitors of the country, um, and this is very much in line with uh, Moscow's position, we'll see later on. Um, phenomena of the country protest, we saw the massive one on the 17th of uh, May. On the 18th of May, the government also organized counter protests. So the Prime Minister Grevsky bust, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of people from across uh, the different cities in Macedonia to show to the world that he has the support. Then the main opposition party started setting up camps in front of the main government building. And then also the pro-government uh, 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 people also um, supported uh, camps in front of the uh, parliament. And they are calling these camps uh, guardians of democracy. Now, I'm not quite aware of what they are guarding and who are they guarding from, but you can also see 
uh, that there is very interesting iconography with the crosses, and um, 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 it just uh, uh, says a lot of, of how we conduct uh, and we try and see how democracy works in, in the country. Of course, this goes hand in hand with partisan public administration. Um, it is a tool for winning the next elections. So basically, if you are party member of the ruling political parties, you are on a fast track for um, getting a very good job, either Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Transport, Police, you name it. And this is not based on merit system. When election day comes, you should provide at least five or ten signatures of people that you have convi convinced to vote for this government. And that's how we have a total state capture over state, uh, state institutions. And the state line and the party line are here mixed. Um, of course, this leads to the next slide, which is uh, Kumanova. Uh, it's, it was a huge scale, large scale police operation conducted on the 9th and 10th of May. It's a city in northern uh, Macedonia, very close to the Serbian and Kosovo borders. Um, but it became very prominent in the news uh, for a police action. You know, it was, it was supposed to be just another police action, but uh, there is more than that. Whenever there is any sort of political instability in Macedonia, uh, there is a pattern of worsening the security situation. And um, this case, if it hadn't been managed successfully, it could have been uh, a Pandora box because um, uh, it alerted the whole region, it alerted international media, and it was a high-intensity operation. More than 30 hours of uh, uh, fighting uh, resulted in 18 deaths, and more, deter more than 13, 35 policemen uh, were uh, injured and hurt. Luckily, there were no civilian casualties. The main premise was that the government initiated this action to detain a terrorist group, uh, some of them coming from Macedonia, some of them coming from Kosovo, and I think there was one coming from Albania. Um, but as I mentioned, this has managed to put the entire region on, on, on alertness. Kosovo uh, police uh, have, um, they have strengthened the patrols with Macedonia. Serbia also sent uh, gendarmerie and also police uh, units, also even Bulgaria discussed the Macedonian uh, issue, and it was all over the media. But the main question about this event is why now and why was this happening at this, uh, um, at this point in time? One of the theories that got from prominence was that this was allegedly a government setup, that uh, the idea behind this was to defoc allegedly to defocus the public attention from the wiretapped materials, which I've mentioned were revealing scandalous materials. And it would steer an ethnic conflict, again, which would uh, sort of uh, loosen the, from the situation from the wiretap revelations. And also it would focus in the entire society on security. This would give the current prime minister all the necessary needs to once and for all um, uh, deal with whatever uh, terrorist uh, activities are out there. And I don't personally agree with this premise, uh, but just uh, there is uh, this interesting tweet by a professor at London School of Economics, James Kerlindy, James Kerlindy, who says, when it becomes possible to even consider the most outlandish conspiracy theories, you know that something is very, very wrong. And that's the main pro problem. I don't, see, I don't think that this was the case in the, in the, the Kumanova, that it was a government set up. But it just thinking about it says that, you know, first and foremost, there is a mistrust among the population towards the security sector, towards the security system, towards the police intelligence. And also, you know, there was a big gap on regional security cooperation. You know, how did Macedonia and Kosovo authorities, for example, uh, uh, cooperate? Um, and then we had a statement by the president of the country saying that he was aware of the existence of the group since the beginning of the year. Then again, this only feeds this uh, theory that, you know, maybe it was a government setup, because the main question is why did the government authorities wait for so long in order to just act 
right now when it, Macedonia was in a political uh, crisis. Um, I, as I said, I don't personally believe uh, it was a, in this premise. It was a too large scale operation. As I mentioned, there were 18 deaths. More than 35 policemen were uh, injured. This alerted the entire region, and it could have easily got out of hands. Um, and interestingly not enough, it showed inter-ethnic cohesion. Uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, inflame inter-ethnic uh, relations at the initial state. So for example, um, here you would see uh, statements by um, ethnic Albanian relevant actors in Macedonia and the region on issued on 9th of May. And most of them were along the lines not to engage in provocations, to show restraint. Uh, the Albanian MFA said condemning all acts on violence. Um, it was, they were not inflammatory at that stage. Um, and, you know, Kosovo MFA, for example, says, you know, we don't support anything that would destabilize uh, Macedonia. Um, interestingly enough, I just go this slide, you will see that there is a chronology, I worked on chronology of more notable security-related incidents in Macedonia. And you can see that there were several incidents before that, like starting 28th of October, November, December, April, where we had incidents such as Macedonian government being uh, a target of grenades. Um, then we had uh, another um, uh, building, government building hit by grenades. And all of them were unresolved. So this just shows that, uh, you know, it just adds to the whole uh, questioning period of why the authorities did not react uh, promptly and whether this may be interlinked with, um, with the whole situation. Um, of course, we have a new uh, player on the ground, uh, Moscow, um, and it's, um, it's new for us. It's, uh, it's something that, according to me, uh, Moscow used uh, the vulnerable uh, position Macedonia is at the moment on political security uh, context and also economic uh, reasons, and provided an entry point to Macedonia. For example, uh, on the 17th of May, where the big anti-government protests were taking place, there was an official statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of Russia saying that these are Western-backed organizations. They want color revolution. Um, and uh, on the police action in Kumanovo, there was full, full support to Macedonia authorities to conduct whatever operation is necessary to eliminate uh, terrorists. And also, according to Moscow, it was just a result of how uh, Kosovo, uh, as a uh, self-proclaimed, according to them, republic, doesn't have any rule of law. And uh, that is one of the problems in the region. Now, this was, uh, as I mentioned, a plethora of statements. Um, here they are. Um, yeah, so here is May 16. Situation in Macedonia is being led to a color revolution. The West has launched plans to do so. So it's the whole Ukraine rhetorics uh, all over and over again. Um, a number of opposition movements and largely West-inspired NGOs have chosen to follow the logic of the streets and the notorious color revolution scenario. Um, and this all started this year. In 2013, 14, 12, 11, 2010, no statements whatsoever. So this is completely new to, to Macedonia. Moscow was never interested uh, in, in Macedonia as it's interested now. Again, the main question is, uh, why and why now? I think that um, Moscow fosters its own foreign policy uh, goals in Europe, including the Balkans. It promotes first and foremost Russian position uh, on Ukraine. Uh, if you can see on January 31st, uh, basically part of the statements was saying that uh, they, uh, the, the, when, when the wiretapping material started leaking out, they say that they would, uh, they prohibit unconstitutional coup d'etats. And that's something that they have been uh, largely um, uh, promoting, which should be embedded in the OSCE framework. Then, uh, as I mentioned, there was like a very 
unrealistic uh, comment on Kosovo, and that there is no rule of law there, and that uh, it's all coming from uh, this state, and is again maintaining their non-recognition position. And also, a new thing is the extent uh, of energy security in the Balkans. Uh, there is this new <laughs> Turkish stream, uh, after the South Stream failed idea, to connect uh, Russia with uh, uh, Central Europe through Turkey, Greece, ha Macedonia, Serbia, and Hungary uh, with a pipeline. And it would be of interest for Moscow to have a um, stable uh, uh, government in power who fences Moscow's policies and uh, who would allow this Turkey stream to be built because you have uh, Orban in Hungary, Vucic in Serbia, Tsipras in Greece, and now you have Gretzky in Macedonia. Um, apart from official channels, every day there are a number of uh, um, uh, stories on Macedonia coming from uh, Sputnik, which would be Russia's uh, um, um, state-financed uh, uh, news agency, into issuing statements like uh, this one. Uh, Macedonia led to color rev revolution by West, says Russian foreign ministry. We have never confronted uh, this before. As I mentioned, we are masters in domestic propaganda style, but coming from external sources, it's a bit difficult to filter that through. And, to, and this is going uh, with sensational news. Like some of these stories went far by saying that it was the CIA agents who were allegedly killed in Kumano when CIA was behind um, um, uh, issues like this, which is completely nonsense. But it just says, that uh, not being able to confront um, this, it's, uh, gaining, it's, it's influencing how public opinion uh, in Macedonia thinks about these cases. And I'm afraid that if this propaganda style continues, we would have uh, more of the public opinion aligned towards uh, uh, statements uh, like uh, this one, because one of the national sports in the Balkans is uh, conspiracy theories. You can sell that uh, to everyone, and it's something that many people enjoy doing. Of course, it's worth mentioning that uh, most of the people are in favor of EU and NATO. I want to conclude by saying a few things. Uh, Macedonia is over and over again at the crossroads. Uh, internationally, there is a, a, a Greek veto which uh, hampers Macedonia democratic reforms, hampers accession to the EU and NATO, and this. Uh, not able to sustain uh, the country into this pattern anymore. Um, we are facing internally democratic challenges. Public uh, state institutions have been um, politicized and it's very difficult to divide politics and uh, party lines anymore. As I mentioned, the economy showed uh, some progress, but this would be affected by the political uh, and security crisis. From front runners, Macedonia has become one of the laggards, and we're now probably at the end of the line. And I think that the EU has, uh, has needs to understand that it has also a moral responsibility to unlock somehow the Macedonian uh, uh, issue. Uh, there, is a very, there was a very good proposal, which is worth thinking of. It's uh, based on uh, the Serbia-Kosovo model. It's on uh, where Kosovo and Serbia's succession talks is put under Chapter 35. To have also the name dispute to be put also into this chapter, which is Others, where in parallel to the resolution of the name dispute with Greece, Macedonia would also negotiate uh, with the EU uh, on, accession, uh, on accession to the European Union. And I think that now this is this momentum and this is this window of opportunity that Macedonia is facing with that if the EU doesn't do anything more concrete and if it's just only getting new elections, I think that we're facing new Erdogan situation where the new party in power would again uh, get uh, re-elected and democratic reforms would be stalled and that's why it's, it's very important to have the accession negotiations unblocked and as soon as possible. Otherwise, the country we've seen through Kumanova has also the potential to destabilize the entire region. And I would just like to end with um, this um, tweet. It's uh, the EU Enlargement Commissioner, uh, Johannes Hahn, who is the main uh, mediator on, on, on the Macedonian political 
crisis, and this just illustrates uh, how we do politics in Macedonia. Uh, all of the leaders of the political parties were in Brussels to 12-hour talks, but they couldn't reach an agreement. And uh, he went in public saying that no fines will yet on, in tax on Macedonia, very disappointed about lack of responsibility plus leadership of some. It just explains how difficult the situation is and that uh, uh, EU engagement should not stop here and it should be in a more of a bulldozer type of uh, diplomacy. Thank you very much and looking forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Andrea. Um, we will open for in a second. Oops, I see. Uh, but since I am the chair, I will, I will of course, uh, exploit that situation. Um, before we kick off, make, I would like to ask you um, to elaborate a little bit more on the name issue. Um, because it is the, uh, the, the mother of all problems, right? Uh, remind us a little bit, of course, the Greek position and why it's so difficult. And maybe, if, you know, it, do you see any solution? Except you, you indicated something now, put it under under chapter thirty-five, but in the, when it comes to actually the name itself, uh, you know what 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 kind of ideas have been floating? Thank you. Um, yes, you're completely right by saying this is matter of all, and that was uh, one of the main points of the uh, presentation. As I mentioned, the the name is uh, mediated by the UN. Um, nothing concrete has been. Uh, uh, negotiated. Uh, it's, it's, it, the negotiations are far behind the public uh, uh, being involved in this, so the public is not very much aware. Um, but we know that in 2008, uh, there was, uh, uh, in, just after the Bukhara summit, or before the Bukhara summit, the government was uh, sort of sending signals that it's ready to accept um, Republic of Macedonia in brackets Skopje. Uh, of course, they would never acknowledge this, uh, but this was uh, shared later on. And also, uh, thanks to the wiretapping materials, uh, there was a proposal also that was uh, gaining on sympathies among uh, government uh, officials. It was somehow like Democratic Republic of Northern Macedonia or Republic of Northern Brackets Macedonia, something along, along those lines. Uh, the problem with the name dispute is that um, it is more than a name dispute. Uh, when you look into the UN uh, uh, work, it's only referring to the name. But, um, for example, the Greek authorities, um, they, they want to put also nationality into the whole context and also language. So those are the identity markers of the, of the, of the nation. And uh, this is problematic for Skopje. Those are the red lines that... Uh, our government uh, in Macedonia, uh, or I think along the population, would would not necessarily accept. Sorry, there's a, the name of the language and the yes. So one of, of the, the proposals citizen. by the UN mediator was uh, to change, of course, the name, but also under language and under citizens to have you you would not be allowed to say, I'm Macedonian or I speak Macedonian language, but the proposed solution was that you would be then saying. I am a citizen of Northern Republic of Macedonia, or I, I don't speak Macedonian, but I speak the language of the Northern Republic of Macedonia, which is something that is uh, out of reality, I'm afraid. And of course, that this did not uh, gain any sympathies uh, in, 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 in Skopje. Uh, so it's, a very, uh, very, it's very much of an identity question, I'm afraid. Uh, and nothing has been happening on major lately. So can I s still ask you, because we, nobody understands Greece, do we? I mean, it's strange for us. Can you, although you're not exactly <laughs> yeah, the right person to ask, but nonetheless, can you try and do a few sentences, ex kind of explain to us why why this why Greece is so upset about this? Well, not, I'm not a historian, of course, um, but uh, Greek position, as I mentioned, is that uh, Macedonia, uh, that this is the official Greek position, has an irredentistic. Uh, um, uh, views on uh, the Greek part of Macedonia, which is called Macedonia, um, and uh, that ultimately that would be one of the one of the uh, uh, reasons why they need to differentiate between th their northern neighbor, which is Republic of Macedonia, and the region Macedonia. Um, so that that's their main sort of uh, story. Okay, let's let's open up. Um, I have one question here too already. Um, please, just, uh, yes, 
men yeah, there's a microphone behind you. Don't forget to say who you are. Pernille, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, Pernille Riki, I'm a senior researcher here at NUPI. I have a question concerning EU um, membership uh, kind of prospects and the, and the popular support for EU membership. Has it changed over the years? Uh, and, and has, it, uh, has it also changed as a consequence of, of, uh, of kind of the Russian interest in Macedonia? Mm. Can you see kind of that there is a drop in EU uh, in, in the kind of support for EU membership? Uh, I would not put the Russian influence um, directly connected with, uh, with the, the answer because, as I mentioned, it's very new. Uh, but the, due to the Greek veto, it has declined. Uh, when you look into like opinion polls several years ago, you would see even 90% of the population up for EU membership. Now, this has uh, declined, not dramatically, but let's say 70. Now, I'm not aware of the latest polls, but the lines are between 70, 80, 75 percent, which, which just suggests that uh, if, if this uh, veto uh, thing continues to, to, to happen, that it may, it reinforced by Russian influence, it may fall uh, even more. Um, of course, then the, there are two main questions when you ask here. The first one is whether you are up for your membership. Mass of the vast majority of the population would say yes, but then it's whether you are up for membership if you have to change your name. Then you would not get the support by majority of, of the population, and that's something that, of course, it's also different among ethnic structure. If you ask ethnic Albanians, they would go for changing the name, uh, changing the name for the sake of getting into the EU, while well, this would be completely uh, different from the ethnic Macedonians who would not, not opt in for that. Okay, uh, I'll give the next to, to Mr. Brinkari, since we have <laughs> Very nice to, to see you again. My name is Steiner Brin. I work at the Nansen Peace Center in uh, Lillehammer, and we've been involved in Macedonia the last uh, 20 years. And uh, only twice have I been in really serious trouble, I think. It was the first time on the airport in Thessaloniki in 1996. I asked, is it possible to fly from here to Macedonia? <laughs> I didn't know that the name of the airport was Macedonia. And the second time was in 2000. I was interviewed by a journalist uh, about the name issue. And I had actually a proposal that was Macbania. That was published. And the next day when I came down to breakfast in the hotel, uh, I was sure I was not going to survive that uh, day. And my proposal was not, uh, I guess, <laughs> accepted. But I have a general comment. I want to hear your impression, and I have a specific question. My com we have been working on a very specific issue, integrated education. And I think now in nine municipalities in Macedonia, the model of integrated education, uh, bilingual, uh, including Macedonians and Albanians, as well as in East Macedonia, Macedonian and Turkish population, has given me the feeling that things are really moving forward in a very good way when we talk about inter-ethnic, multi-ethnic relations in Macedonia. But then, of course, when I come to visit, we go and travel to these municipalities. We meet these directors of the schools. I see all these little kids playing together. So I really feel you know, good things are happening. I've even invited the directors of schools in Oslo to come to Macedonia to see actually what integration is like. Because in Norway, we deal with integration as assimilation. You integrate well when you somehow adapt to Norwegian ways. While well, the model, the Nansen integrated model in Macedonia is more equality, treat each other with respect, but learn to know each other both ways. And is this my general perception of things getting better? How does that resonate with you, living in Macedonia and having lived there these you know, last uh, 20 years? Mm. My question is more specific. When you talk about the Kumanovo incident, uh, you somehow said, well, you don't buy that the government was involved and so forth. But elaborate a little bit, because the accusation that these people actually were paid, and uh, Ramush Haradinai was involved, at least I heard rumors about it. I know Tachi is coming here on Monday, so we can actually ask him <laughs> what he knows about it. But if it was not, if the Macedonian government was not involved, who actually was masterminding it, because I assume it was an operation led by somebody. Okay, um, first question. Um, 
on the on the feeling um, and how interethnic relations work in Macedonia. There has been a dramatic improvement, uh, I believe, after 2001. But I'm afraid that uh, the Ohrid Framework Agreement has also led to establishing more of a parallel societies rather than uh, joint ones. Um, of course, we live together, we live, but we live side by side. There are improvements in many areas, such as uh, uh, the project that you are running, but there is still a uh, reluctance among majority of stakeholders to embrace this, to embrace the fact that uh, children and uh, you know uh, who attend schools should learn Albanian in order to, to, to even optional. It shouldn't be mandatory. So there are still obstacles, and these obstacles are very high on the political agenda as well, uh, in terms of, uh, for example, just two days ago, in a few years ago, there was a huge uh, incident about the re rename of two uh, schools in the city of Skopje, who were having Macedonian names, but then they got illegally renamed into Albanian names. And then there was a huge uh, incident taking place in terms of like how can this affect interethnic uh, cohesion? Because there was a deal between the parties, two years later, all of a sudden under the carpet, the government decided to rename those schools uh, now having Albanian names. So if now it wasn't a problem, what was the problem two years ago? So we see interethnic relations, I'm afraid, as a tool to also gain some political leverage. Even though there is a junior coalition partner in government representing the ethnic Albanian interests, uh, if, you, if you ask, if you talk to ethnic Albanians, uh, they would say to you that uh, they are there only for uh, interests. They do not necessarily represent uh, the, uh, the interests of the ethnic Albanians, so they are more, more of a comfortable position staying in power for how long? 15 years now? So that, that's, I think that in general th things have improved a lot, but they're still uh, not necessarily come to that stage where, where you would say that it's a harmonious I think that there is a lot of work that needs to be done in that context. When it comes to Kumanovo, there are speculations, information, misinformation every day. Trust me, like I cannot keep up with uh, all the uh, media reports uh, about who the intelligence services contacted, when, who was the first to call, who, you know. It just, now we are at the stage where confusion is better than reality. So. The international media would pick up something, but that doesn't necessarily resemble the truth. And the truth is that we don't know what the truth is. There is still an ongoing process, but an ongoing investigation. But um, we, according to previous examples, we, uh, Macedonian security services are not transparent. So that's why international actors also look for independent uh, international investigation to be conducted on this Kumanovo incident. I don't know by whom and how, but they, they, uh, the notion that they're looking for it says something. Um, again, I, I don't think that uh, uh, it would be of the government interest. Of course, it may defocus a little bit on the attention of the wiretapped materials, but immediately the next day after Kumanovo, the ambassadors of the most influential Western countries went into the government and said that, yes, we are very... Uh, aware of the security situation of the government, but that should not defocus you from the actual political developments. And the day afterwards, uh, three ministers, two ministers, and one high government official uh, resigned. So it was short-lived, even if that was the main idea, to defocus, it was short-lived. The crisis is still so deep that it's ongoing, even today, like Zoran Zaev, the leader of the opposition party, is still leaking materials. Just to somehow uh, end on a positive note with my little exchange, because it is kind of depressing to hear uh, you talk that you know since 1995, since 2005, there hasn't really been that much uh, improvement. But this nonsense model of integrated education that is uh, initiated by the nonsense center in Skopje we, is now actually being applied in southern Serbia on Serb Albanian schools. We managed in Macedonia because maybe it was easier there.
But because we managed in Macedonia, it's actually spreading, and we hope also to implement it in some uh, schools in, in Kosovo. And it's already happening in Herzegovina, that has mm. two schools on the one roof. Teacher, the Minister of Education, go and visit Macedonia to see and learn. So, in terms of integrated education, Macedonia is not the backyard of, of Europe. You're doing something exciting, and people are coming even from Oslo to see and learn. Thank you. Thank you for the for the positive note there. It's it's certainly needed, and, and I shortened, I'm sure there are also other glimpses of hopes. Absolutely, uh, I'll pass on next now to Kari. Thank you. Um, this was very interesting. Um, I'm a senior researcher here at NUPI as well. I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that Moscow's role um, in internal policy is growing day by day, and you referred to the press statements of the Russian MFA. I'm just wondering. Are there any other signs of um, this increased influence and how is the public responding to it? Uh, my second question is whether you can spend a few minutes to, to talk about the main regional challenges in your opinion. Hmm. Thanks. Um, I'm afraid that the how Moscow conducted policy in the region, in Macedonia in particular, and how it all became part of the agenda was through this uh, South Stream and then Turkey Stream. So in Macedonia, it was supposed to, uh, uh, or the original plan was that Macedonia gets a segment of this South Stream and that Russia would pay for it because it's a payoff of a previous debt. Um, and it was seen primarily through economic uh, logic. With uh, how things started evolving with the Kumanova crisis and the protests, they have enhanced their, their statements on Macedonia and their interest. And at this stage, it's all about uh, statements. But at the same time, one of the very disturbing uh, uh, comments by Russian minister Lavrov was that um, he was afraid that there would be some sort of annexation of Macedonia uh, by Bulgaria. And this was something that we were totally shocked because no one even mentioned, nor anyone was aware of it. But I'm just going to illustrate the next day, the uh, Russian ambassador was uh, summoned in uh, um, uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, where they gave protest about what he mentioned. While Macedonian authorities cannot do that, they haven't had any reaction on that uh, statement whatsoever, and which is worrying. So that, is, that says that the official, uh, official response is still weak. Another example would be uh, Russia, uh, EU sanctions on Russia regarding the Ukraine crisis. So Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Serbia are the only country uh, in Europe which have not aligned their uh, foreign policies regarding sanctions. Um, and at that point, at this point, these are the forums that we're discussing about Russian, Russian influence. Um, on regional challenges, um, of course, there are shining examples, as always, and the EU wants to see those and promote those as uh, uh, to say that they, they are conducting great foreign policy. Uh, recently, it's uh, Belgrade, uh, Pristina dialogue, and also uh, the reapproachment with, uh, between Serbia and Albania, which has been greeted a lot. And I think this is a very positive step into the uh, 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 regional context. Uh, on security challenges, there are this, this issue on foreign fighters, which is a thing that is uh, gaining on momentum, unfortunately, as the numbers are growing of uh, Western Balkans-born nationals fighting in Syria and Iraq, and having in mind that these people can travel freely to Schengen, uh, um, says about uh, the potential risk they bring to our society, but also to European societies as well. And this is apart from our regional and domestic issue, it's also European uh, trend. Um, and then also lately the issue of migrants uh, coming from primarily uh, Middle East, Syria, uh, looking for a better life in Europe. Uh, and one of the main transit routes uh, is the Balkans, or more specifically Turkey, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia. And then once they're in Hungary, they're everywhere. So this would be... I think uh, um, the main main challenges, uh, of course, there are domestic issues in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, but but Kosovo and Serbia are are at the focus right now. 
Maybe we could add that you, you said in, during lunch that of the migrants, there are like six, seven hundred people every day mm. going into Macedonia. So it's not small numbers you're talking about. All right, sir, you're next. My name is uh, Kjell Nyhus. I work for the Norwegian Press Association as a secretary for the Norwegian Press Complaints Commission. And uh, I've been working closely with um, colleagues in, in Macedonia for the last six, five, six years. Um, in fact, I'm going to Strumika on Sunday um, on a seminar uh, about hate speech and about establishing a press complaints commission in, uh, in Macedonia, which in fact is established, but uh, with great difficulties. Uh, um, I have two questions. Could you say on a broad on a broad scale a little bit about uh, the media situation in in Macedonia? We, as foreigners, get our our, our input from from uh, several media, but but can we trust anything coming from uh, state-owned media in in uh, in Macedonia? Um, and my second question, uh, as Foreigners um, trying to do uh, what we mean, what we consider positive work uh, and democratic work in Macedonia. Are we in a danger of being being used uh, by be being called foreign agents trying to trying to uh, sort of uh, work against the acting uh, acting uh, government? Okay, uh, on media. I'm not a media specialist, but what I know for sure is that uh, the situation has deteriorated a lot in the last several years. The main problem is that the government uh, has um, employed an approach where, for example, private media houses, apart from the public uh, broadcast company, uh, private media houses, which in the past would be critical, would now all of a sudden change to report what the government instructs them to report. So, you know, if you look, if you watch, uh, I don't know, newspaper, uh, news uh, at seven o'clock, you'll hear that Macedonia is a uh, leader, leader in Europe, it's leader in the region, people live happy, that sort of discourse. A main tool for conducting this is through buying ad space. So basically, uh, the government, through government-sponsored uh, uh, campaigns, is buying the loyalty from the directors uh, of, of these media houses. And that's why they, in exchange, have to uh, report on what the government has to say uh, without any critical lens whatsoever. Um, so whether you can trust media in Macedonia, of course, on the other hand side, then you have critical media uh, who struggle to exist and um, who are, are, you know, under threat all the time. And um, there was even a case of uh, imprisonment of one journalist, but then uh, he got uh, released because of international pressure and so on and so forth. So I'm afraid that one of the areas that Brussels would definitely have to look into is media freedoms, um, because that's how you get informed. That's how you construct public opinion. That's how you, cons you provide people thoughts that they can use then to critically assess the government role and position. And I'm afraid that at the moment this is not happening. Um, there have been plethora then of different news websites that try to utilize uh, the power of the internet and social media, but unfortunately in rural Macedonia areas, uh, mainstream media works the best. And uh, when you have all this ordered, uh, uh, type of uh, events, uh, what ne media needs to report on, then I'm a bit skeptical that it can, they can provide the real picture. On the second question, I don't know what to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid. Um, there hasn't been, I, I haven't heard of uh, uh, such a case. Um, so I think that um, I mean, I don't know you personally, so, uh, but I think that you're, you're fine um, uh, working in Macedonia. Um, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Sorry, I almost forgot you. <laughs> Please.
Thank you very much. Camilo uh, Rosak, I'm a senior advisor in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Southeast Europe section. And uh, thank you very much for a very informing presentation. I, uh, I'm glad, although you are uh, saying that the situation in so many ways uh, is deteriorating uh, for your country, you, you still uh, hang on to uh, that there is a window of opportunity right now. And, uh, and I'm glad you're saying that. But what you're also saying is that um, the election, which was maybe an offer in a in a peace talk or at least uh, mediation talks, is not the only solution. Um, and um, I mean, this uh, what you have been um, informing us uh, of uh, about today could be uh, a week seminar. So I'm looking forward to uh, to more information um, and. Um, the issue I wanted to ask is uh, because you're you're saying um, on the mediation, uh, there is a lot of mediation going on uh, in your country uh, with the EU, uh, with the UN, and uh, it doesn't seem to um, to produce a lot of results. Um, and you are claiming that there needs to be a little bit more of a bulldozer approach. Uh, so I want to challenge you on what could a bulldozer approach um, yield of results that the, uh, the so far mediation we have seen is not uh, giving uh, the situation in uh, Macedonia. So Two things. Um, I would be very uh, prompt. Uh, let's imagine a bulldozer carrying carrots. So that's, that's the EU accession. If that bulldozer wants to conduct serious changes in Macedonia, and it has something to offer, and that's you know, screening of chapters 22, 24, which is judiciary and uh, uh, internal affairs, or even opening one chapter, I think that you have political leaders in Macedonia accepting uh, the offered uh, solution, whatever that be. And this is the stake. This is the stake. It's, it's, the, it's the possibility for Macedonia to show concrete step forwards towards EU integration, which has been stalled for six, seven years now. And this may work. Additionally, you may have the bulldozer carrying sticks, and that could be October EU press conference where the EU would say that Macedonia, due to the latest developments, is losing the recommendation for starting accession negotiations which can be very worrying, and no one wants that to become the case. Uh, but uh, if we try and look into the tone of what Brussels has to say, it's a real threat. And then what are we going to do? Who, who is going to lose more into this context? So, and whether that would induce uh, challenge, uh, that would induce any uh, reforms? I'm afraid that this second uh, answer is not the most uh, suited, best suited one, because this may then be very much profiled by the current uh, leadership into saying that this is just an example of what we were saying to you all these years, that the international community is, everyone is against Macedonia. And unfortunately, then we would be, you know, it would be all closed gated. And then whatever now possible window of opportunity there is by international actors to get involved in Macedonia would be gone. So that's why I think that the bulldozer with the carrots is uh, my preferred version of it. But the second, uh, but if I may follow up that one, there's, there's, another, there's another party to the conflict, Greece. Wouldn't the bulldozer need to roll over Greece a little bit as well? Or, or I mean, they need to be made concessions from that side as well, wouldn't it? Um, yes, of course. <laughs> more carrots to Greece. Yeah, more to give. Um, there are... There are some serious uh, considerations. Uh, uh, you know, like when you open accession negotiations, Greece had 70 possibilities, 7-0, to veto Macedonia on every single chapter. When, whenever Macedonia opens a chapter on education, it can veto it. So there is a flexibility on the Greek side uh, as well. Um, but also, for example, screening for determining whether the country is ready to start accession negotiation is purely technical exercise which uh, would induce some change of Macedonia prospects for EU integration, does not, even though it requires Greece's uh, commitment to say yes, 
it may float without uh, getting into all this drama about how they have quit their red lines as well. So I think that there can be some models that can be implemented here. Okay, we have one final question. Gentlemen back there. Well, just uh, two short uh, questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the question is, is the present government really interested in the country becoming a member of the EU? Uh, what we are talking about is uh, the bottom line is money. Uh, we haven't talked much about that, but uh, when you looked at local elections in Macedonia, it was very much about money. If you had the governing position in the in the municipality, you could make a lot of money. And now in the same way, the central government people, Grevsky and Mialkov, becoming very, very rich, and they want to keep the situation as it is. So the question is, do they really want to become a member of the EU? I, I don't see any sort of significant motivation. It's just going through the motions, and that's it. And in fact, even sabotaging the process by all these monuments. The second question, uh, the Islamic uh, awakening. Uh, you have this uh, Salafi, Wahhabi uh, awakening. I was wondering, does this uh, complicate the, the relations? Because uh, traditionally, the uh, Muslims and the, and the Orthodox lived quite well together in, in Macedonia. Of course, there were massacres and all that through the centuries. But basically, they managed to get along. Does this new radicalization uh, change the, the picture? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the first uh, question, I don't think that, um, see, like when you look into the Western Balkans, I don't think that there is an option for you to say, no, I don't want to get into EU and NATO. You may say, yes, in, you may say, no, I don't want to get into the EU, but then you would be doing it because your people want to get into EU and NATO. So you have, it's a demand by the population. When, then I try to answer your question more directly. The, the answer would be, let's unblock accession negotiations and see whether Gorelsi is up for joining EU and NATO, because then you would see the reform uh, possibilities of the country to uh, be going into the EU very fast or very slow. But at the, you know, he would not be able to then uh, say, it's not up to me, it's up to Greece, and we're doing everything in power to overcome this issue. But these days, he's sitting very comfortable because he controls media. So media cannot report that every day that why Macedonia is not joining EU and NATO. Citizens already got very comfortable as well because m the most tangible result of EU integration so far was visa liberalization. They had the visa liberalization in 2009. They are not informed what are the advantages of Macedonia joining the EU. They just want to, know, they just want to be there. So there is no pressure whatsoever for Gresk. And then there's the international community, which is, of course, uh, you know, when you look into Ukraine and uh, uh, the Middle East um, and Africa, they are preoccupied with that. So there is no pressure whatsoever coming from their side. And that's why we don't know whether Gresk is, com is committed or not to EU integration process. Uh, let's not forget when he was elected in 2006, he was, the international media portrayed him as the very young, ambitious uh, reformer who is a technocrat and uh, would do miracles uh, with Macedonia. But then we had the Greek veto, and then we don't know what this person really uh, has become. Um, on the second question on Islamic um, uh, and radicalization, uh, on Islamic issues, um, there is there has been an increase of uh, this has been a question that has been raised because of the Syria and Iraq uh, battlefields. Before that, uh, there were not that much of an information, and as you mentioned, people were living uh, in coexistence. These days, it's the same. Uh, you know, there are just individuals from Macedonia, Kosovo, Bosnia, Serbia, who go and fight, and uh, some of them, not all, may return with radical ideas. But it's up to us uh, to, to make sure that this is not getting, gaining on more and more prominence. And uh, I don't think that uh, majority of population, regardless if it's Christian Orthodox or uh, Muslims, uh, would uh, agree with what's, uh, what these people going uh, in Syria are doing. Um, Islamic religious community in Skopje uh, is very proactive on this issue. 
For example, every day, the main mosques in Skopje, on every Friday, you would hear uh, how uh, uh, there are calls that people should not go to Syria and Iraq because that's not according to, uh, to their teachings, which is very powerful. For example, then you have the Islamic religious community in Macedonia initiating, but didn't find any support whatsoever, which is very sad, a comprehensive uh, project proposal of resocialization, reintegration of foreign fighters. Uh, it was around 100 pages long. Um, and unfortunately, at the same time, you have Islamic religious communities saying that there are two or three mosques in the city of Skopje which are not under their control, which they believe may be one of the centers for uh, radicalization of uh, people. And Macedonian police answers to that question that we don't have any authorities whatsoever to uh, uh, get involved into this question, which is really sad because uh, it just uh, says that you put the question under the carpet instead of trying to resolve it. It doesn't have to be through any sort of police involvement, but you can have other actors like local community leaders, political parties, or stakeholders that are relevant to this to this case. Um, but I think that in general, it's a problem that uh, is affecting the entire region, somewhere more, like Kosovo, Bosnia, uh, and Albania, somewhere less, as Serbia and Macedonia, but it's still uh, a very important one. Okay, well, I think we are approaching the end. Um, many of the issues you did talk about are specific for Macedonia, but some of them, of course, are recognized from other countries in the region as well, uh, such as media bias and, and leaders who, who are, we're not really sure if they really want to go all the way to, to, into EU or not. Uh, if that's any comfort, I don't know, but at least it's a regional problem. And I think another, uh, hopefully, awakening, awakener for the, for the international community is that uh, the lack of progress, what happened in Macedonia, if, if that happens to the other countries, you can have more of the same as it were. Mm. So I hope that, you know, the, the reluctancy within the European Union for enlargement, uh, you know, is, is that it's being somewhat pushed back <laughs> from your negative experience, example, so sorry to say, to put it that way, but you know what I mean. Uh, and hopefully that there will be some kind of unblocking as, as a result of this. So thank you so much again, Andrea, for coming and sharing with us. Um, and thank you for all of you for coming and asking good questions uh, in this beautiful day. And uh, see you around another day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.